Thanks, folks, for joining in. It's a real pleasure and honor to have Dan do the Lightning Talks. Uh, Dan will tell you the story about why Lightning Talks really matter. But uh, Dan is the original creator of the Appium project, and uh, he's been the uh, he, he actually, Dan, was it uh, you, me, Srini, a couple of us just happened to have a conversation at one of the Selenium conferences and decided that we need to do an Appium conference in India. And so we did one in uh, 2019. And uh, again, we are here. Uh, thanks for all your help and support in putting the conference together. So cool. I mean, it's, uh, again, great to have Dan. And uh, we're going to kickstart the lightning talks. Um, uh, I, I think uh, I'll let uh, Dan kind of uh, explain how this is going to work and maybe even give a little bit of uh, the background uh, around the lightning talks, why this is important. So over to you, Dan. Uh, thanks again for joining from Vancouver. All right. Yeah, good. I, I'll say good morning. I know it's 6 p.m. where you guys are. So I this is why I wish I, I like India. You know, it's 6 p.m. on a Friday night. We have 130 people on one track of this conference just coming to hear people talk about uh, cool things with test automation. Uh, and so I have the task of introducing those people this, well, this evening for you guys, this morning for me. Uh, so quickly, I'll sort of set out the rules. Uh, I guess I'll start with why we do this and then we'll set out the rules. And then we have five people on the schedule and we have room for a few more. I will tell you to message Naresh if you wanna get added to the list. Uh, if you, uh, we still have room for, I would say at least three more, something like that, uh, if people wanna sign up. Uh, so first, why do we do this? Uh, we do this because the Appian project would not exist largely without lightning talks. Uh, so I won't go through the whole story again, but uh, this project started as the uh, sort of aftermath of a lightning talk I gave at the Selenium conference almost 10 years ago. Uh, I think it's nine and a half years ago at this point. Uh, and so when we made Appium Conf, we decided we wanted to always have lightning talks uh, and sort of the idea of furthering the tradition and potentially Hopefully one day we'll spawn another highly important, highly successful project. Uh, but if not, uh, I think there's a lot of value in listening to just what people have to say, uh, even if it's just for five minutes. Uh, a lot of people have great ideas. And so I'd like to have as part of this conference an opportunity to give those people a, a large audience to share those ideas with. And hopefully those sort of chemical reactions occur uh, from this. Uh, all right, uh, so rules, uh, there aren't many rules. Uh, Someone's keeping a five minute timer. I'm not doing it. I'll assume it's Naresh, uh, but <laughs> I'll have to cut someone off if they exceed five minutes. So you get five minutes, uh, talk about whatever you like. Um, I thought that those are the rules. That's all there, there is to this. And so with that, uh, let me find our first presenter uh, and promote him. All right, Daniel, your five minutes starts now. I'm keeping the time, I guess. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, hey. Hey everyone, Daniel. Um, and so this talks about a project that I did. Uh, so my last job at Sauce Labs, I reverse engineered a few things for iOS and Android devices. And one thing that we were looking into back then was how do you, this was iOS 10 and 11, like, <laughs> so quite some time ago. So we were looking in ways of how we could, for a real device testing cloud, get like fast video streaming to the cloud, right? So customers could do live testing and it would be super fast, uh, which it wasn't back then. And one of the ideas that we had was, uh, could we reverse engineer how QuickTime does it, right? So you might all know if you open QuickTime, you can actually record iOS screen and everything. So uh, we found a better way and contributed it actually to Appium. Um, but still, you know, I just couldn't get let this one go. So the question is, how do you reverse engineer something like this, right? So as any good senior engineer, like the first thing you do is you try to Google it. Um, like maybe someone has already done this. So you find this video on YouTube that is gone by now, but back then there was one and you're like, yeah, somebody actually did it. So there's a way to get it working. Then you look further and you find discussions online without any links to any solutions. And you're like, no nah, source code attached anywhere to the video. And you're like, oh, okay, damn, it works somehow, but there is no source code anyway. So I thought, you know, how hard can this possibly be? And uh, so basically started uh, reverse engineering this. And the question is, how do you actually do this, right? Uh, I mean, one option is you decompile the source code and then you get something like this and try to understand how it works. Not super easy. The other idea is uh, use Wireshark and uh, look what's going over the wire, right? And I always like to explain this 
uh, if you want to privately reverse engineer a REST API, right? As a comparison, what would you rather do? Look at minified JavaScript code or just look at the you know API in your Chrome browser? So that was basically what I did, right? So I opened Wireshark, stop playing a video, stop playing the video, save the capture, uh, do some post-processing and look at what I get. And then I get this, I'm like, what is that? Uh, and I Google it and I'm like, what is a GNIP? <laughs> and I Google it, I find nothing, all these strings, right? They're not helping me. But at some point it struck me as like, oh, this is just reverse byte order, right? So let's skip some of those. Uh, and then suddenly it all makes sense, right? So this is actually not a GNIP, this is a ping um, because you just have to reverse the byte order and then everything comes together and you see all these values and then, oh, it's full of dictionaries and stuff. And you go through the whole hex dump, uh, figure everything out. Um, and in the end, you find that uh, there's just a bunch of H264 units in there. So I concatenated them all to a file and then I was actually able to play video with uh, video then. One and, second, Daniel, uh, we can't see yeah. your screen at the moment. Uh, oh, you may need to click sharing. Don't worry, uh, we won't take this. I'll pause the clock, okay. go for it. Did you see it? Yeah, now we see it. Ah, uh, okay, totally forgot. Yeah, this, this is the sharing thing that I was talking about. <laughs> Crap, mm. Mm. too nervous. Um, exactly, this is a quick time feature, right? And, um, whoop. and let's see. So then I implemented this, uh, it's open source. Uh, there's a huge reference documentation. So if you're interested in how this actually works uh, under the hood, you can read that. Uh, it's super detailed, explains every little piece of it. Uh, let's skip these things. And also there's a little demo on YouTube where you can actually see me doing it for the first time. So uh, part of the goal was uh, figuring out how to do this and run it on Linux, which is now possible. <laughs> So if for whatever reason you want to have super high quality video streamed from your iOS device to a Linux machine, you can do this now. Um, and as usually, if you do things like this, the cool thing is if you reverse engineer it and actually really understand how it works, you can do even cooler stuff than QuickTime can do. So one thing that uh, is possible with this project is if you want to record audio only, then you can also do that. So there's no need to get a video stream. Right, like if you run an Appium test and you want to capture device audio or something, uh, you could totally use this tool and record the audio output of the device um, on Linux or Mac, whatever you want. Uh, and here's a link to the Golang reference implementation. Right, so this works, you can download it, run it. Uh, like I said, it works on Mac, works on Linux, doesn't work on Windows. Uh, I tried and it's not possible. And uh, that's it. All right. I would say a huge round of applause, but I don't know how that's going to work here. <laughs> but uh, I guess we can also open the floor for some quick questions. Uh, maybe we can take two or three questions. I'll ask a question first uh, to get this rolling. Uh, so you reverse engineered this. Is there anything else you think would be interesting to reverse engineer uh, in terms of adding support for Appium? So this you showed the sort of value you can get out of the process and sort of the unique mm -hmm. things you can bring by reverse engineering as opposed to like using the APIs that come with a thing. Uh, yeah. Do you have any other ideas for things that would be interesting? Uh, I mean, I have another project that I talked about today, right? So it's uh, Go iOS. It allows you to run uh, XC test, for example. So you can use Appium for iOS real devices on Linux, which is pretty cool. Um, also, I enabled some things like, for, uh, for example, Xcode in a recent version has gotten this um, device state simulation feature where you can enable, you know, uh, on the device, uh, a 2G simulation, like lower network uh, speeds, you can activate thermal conditions, uh, degrade the C GPU performance, stuff like that. Uh, it works in Xcode, but you know it's always a little annoying if you have an Appium test and you want to do this actually. I mean, you don't really want to go to Xcode and enable it there. Um, and this is why uh, I added it to Go iOS so you can do it from the command line. So if you run your Appium test, uh, you can just basically run this command line tool, it has JSON output, so it should be super easy to use. And then you can tell the device to, I don't know, behave like it's 40 degrees temperature and toggle all the speed stuff. Yep. Cool. All right, well, thank you very much for presenting. Uh, I'm gonna need a little help from an arrest to find out. I think, okay, Atmaram is now here. That's a name I recognize. So let's make 
I'm sorry, I don't know the genderization of his name, but let's make him or her uh, the next presenter uh, and get rolling with that. Uh, can you do that for me, Naresh? Actually, then uh, Rajdeep is already there. I think. We'll oh, Rajdeep then. Rajdeep, and then we we'll go to Atmara. Hello, I'm Trek 3A here. <laughs> You're on the clock. Fire away. Oh, okay. Um, let me share my screen quickly. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right, welcome everyone. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, Jetpack Compose and how it goes along with APM. Uh, so those who don't know what Jetpack Compose is, it's basically uh, a new view framework for uh, Android. So in traditionally in Android, we have activities and we inflate those activities. Now I'm talking about Android developers here. So they, they use uh, XML markup for defining their activities and then they inflate their activities uh, with views. However, um, there's, slight in, there's a very uh, good improvement there uh, in, in uh, Jetpack Compose. It's a new framework, which is a modern toolkit uh, for building native user interface. Same as before, we have used to build native inter user interface, but it simplifies and accelerates the UI development on Android. Uh, what does that What does that mean? Because uh, traditionally we have to define activities and the views and the layouts in XML markup. Now using Jetpack Compose, we can do it using code and the code basically written in Kotlin. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. And uh, with this, what it means, code is, code is much more easier to handle than handling the configuration of XML files. So it's, uh, it's easier in that sense that it can be developed very quickly. And also code is more reusable than, uh, than XMLs, right? Uh, you can wrap the code, you can, you, can, uh, you can create modules out of it. And same way in Jetpack Compose, you can create composables, which could be used to show on your screen. And you can create those composables in the, uh, and, and store them in your code repository. And then you can compose more out of composables. Yeah? So think of it like when you are developing Android, uh, developing a user face for a game, right? There, there's no, there is no defined position of things there. You just render things whenever you, you and wherever you want on need basis. And uh, Compose does exactly similar things. And because it's so uh, so nice and so developer developer friendly, it is uh, it is gaining a lot of ground. And many companies have already started migrating their views on Compose because it definitely gives gives them an edge over over regular views. Mm -hmm. Now, since it is so popular, it's going to definitely be the future of uh, Android views. Same way in iOS, uh, you might have heard of something like Swift UI. Uh, in case of Android, it's Jetpack Compose. Now, since Jetpack Compose is already out in the world and people are already people have already started building their apps using Jetpack Compose, and then we should talk about what is the testing support for it. Unfortunately, there is no end-to-end -end support in any of the available frameworks right now. And APM is, uh, is also one of them. When I talk about no support, I'm actually lying. There's a very little support because uh, in APM, there are two options. One is APM's uh, UI Automator 2 driver. And there's a broken support there. Why I'm calling it broken is basically you can actually see the view hierarchy and you can find the elements using content description or, or say text and you can operate on them. But whatever you will see in the hierarchy will be just a class, uh, uh, will be a view with the class uh, android.widget.view. So there will not be like any text, uh, edit text or uh, frame layout, linear layout. It Everything will be viewed because uh, it's just a, a hierarchy dumped in terms of accessibility. Uh, it will be something like how does the end user sees your hierarchy and the content descriptions uh, will be visible there. However, if you want to go with your APM UI Automator 2 driver, uh, the support is going to be limited because you'll have to end up uh, adding content description to each and every view that you want to be identified. 
which will basically mess up the accessibility or your uh, accessibility of your uh, application uh, which is a bad idea so another option is uh, apm espresso driver and as of now there is no support in that apm espresso driver now <clears throat> since ui automator 2 uh, and espresso are the framework provided by google which are being utilized by these drivers Google has naturally uh, provided another framework for Jetpack Compose Test Automation. It's called uh, uh, Compose Test Rule. It's basically uh, based on instrumentation again. So uh, what this means is uh, we can actually instrument our application under test and uh, and use this rule. And that's what um, I'm cur currently trying to work on. So in the APM Espresso driver, what we do actually is uh, we instrument our application under test and uh, we create a companion APK, which is instrumentation APK for our application. And in that APK, uh, the work is in progress for adding source code for end-to-end uh, -end test support for Jetpack Compose Automation. Uh, as of now, um, what- One what minute warning. Is, Okay. Sorry. So as of now, the support is very limited, and uh, it is uh, it is available in this uh, GitHub request. And support is only for find element, click, and getting text. Also, there is a support for display. Now you can see it's a huge PR with lots of command, which shows how I'm sure I am with Kotlin right now, but still trying to uh, find my way out here. A lot of uh, good review comments from uh, APM maintainers there. So I'll fix them. After this is pushed, I'll request all of you who are interested to contribute in this uh, repository for more actions, uh, not just find element, but also let's say for find elements for getting displayed, selected. And then, then there are many, many, it's going to be a new driver in itself, inside a driver. So that, right. to summarize, that Maybe gives a quick overview. Two more sentences and then you got to wrap it up. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so there is no need to, I mean, that, that's pretty much it. Uh, so that gives the current status of uh, the support for Jetpack Compose Automation in APM. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rajdeep. Uh, I guess if anyone has a question, raise your hand. Uh, I'll give you like 10 seconds to do that. If you raise your hand, we'll go to you. If not, uh, we'll move on to our next presenter, uh, who I, I know less about than, than Rajdeep. Uh, so... I guess let's go to Atmaram. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. yes. OK. Um, so uh, this talk is a little bit different. Uh, this talk is not about APM or any um, um, test automation uh, framework as such, but this talk is about day-to-day -day activity of tester that is data creation and i'm going to talk about one of the tool that i myself have been contributing uh, as an open source tool so this tool is named as core and this talk is about using core for automating test data creation so you might have been uh, creating test data for your day-to-day -day manual testing or automated testing you you might need to create bulk test data or you might need to do ad hoc test data on most of the scenarios while doing testing right and how this tool can help you over there i'm going to uh, show that so challenges with test data there are typically uh, following challenges that we face with test data like ad hoc test data creation requires manually changing values in postman or curl request so suppose you are using curl or postman suppose uh, so this premise of this entire talk is we are creating test data based on apis so when you are using uh, uh, rest apis for creating test data you might be using postman or curl request for creating this test data and many times we need to capture value from one api for example authorization headers or many times we need to capture some value like some id or something from previous api and pass it to the next api so that we need to do so what we generally do in postman we write some uh, in uh, out, output script or input script and we capture those values right many times we want to make multiple calls by just changing few values in the request so sometimes what what we want to do is like capture the value make n number of calls and create n number of data at a times we want to iterate over response of arrays to make equal number of api calls so like suppose one api gave you a array uh, and we want to 
create that many request and we want to create that many data so these are all challenges associated with test data when we are creating test data through apis and overall it seemed time consuming and there might be many more uh, things which you might have faced so for the for the sake of simplicity i am going to demonstrate a simple application um, within this short uh, uh, talk uh this uh, this application i have created some time back uh, uh, two three uh, two three years back for demonstration purpose this application is shopping application there are categories of uh, products and sub categories of product so what we are going to do is we are going to create category and we are going to create sub category within each category so this yeah. test data we want to create atmar so i'm going to interrupt i think we are not able to see your full video Uh, the your face is getting chopped off. If you okay, okay. Can, uh, now, yes, perfect, perfect. Yeah. So we are going to create category, and we are going to create sub categories within it. So this is a category. This is a sub category. Um, and steps for creating same using API is we are hitting the API endpoint API slash category. We are passing it a name, and in response we are going to get a category ID. Once we create that category, we will get a category ID in response. and when we are creating sub category we will need that category id to be passed for that sub category to be created within the category that we previously created so that's the simple use case that we are going to talk about now how would you how would you do suppose you want to create category sometimes uh, uh, with one name sometimes with other name sometimes you want to create bulk number of categories sub categories you will do all of these ad hoc things while testing right now what we are going to do uh, do is we are going to use a cor which is a open source tool it has a intellij plugin uh, for running this tool uh, it has its own programming language called as a journey programming language it is written in uh, rust a programming language so it can be run on max it can be run on linux it can be run on windows as well so they, uh, they the all rust binary is compiled to the native binary so this is a cross platform tool actually right now the binaries are being published only for max but uh, it could be compiled from sources binary could be compiled from the sources and how cor help here is it can automate sequence of api calls using scripts and each api call can be designed using a request and response template so you get a templating feature in this uh, particular uh, cor cor tool and you can capture values from responses using templates now the way we capture values sometimes some in some templating language or some using paths and all cor has its own syntax for capturing values you can capture arrays you can capture many different values using those templates one minute warning yeah and resultant scripts are like command line utility okay and golden rules for call is it's you it uses same captured value correlate for filling subsequent request Uh, and if some variables from the template is not known at the runtime it asks it to user so let's see the demo so here is a simple script created in cor uh, it will hit the post request for creating category we are capturing value of the id over here and we are passing it to the next request and when i run this it is asking me value for category name because it is not finding it anywhere i will say electronics it it is asking how many sub categories i want to create i will create two i will say tv and mobile all right we need to wrap up so i'll give you two more sentences and then we got to close this out and move to the next person yeah yeah and that's how it has created a test data that that is just the last thing that i am going to show so it has created a category electronics and tv and mobile yeah so that oh. that's that's the tool that you can use any questions i don't see any hands up yet but uh you will be able to contact atram after this i guess if you have any questions uh we have about 13 minutes left in the session and two more talks to do so i'm going to move straight ahead to the next presenter uh andre so andre please uh your time starts now so i have only 3 minutes <laughs> i'm getting rushed five minutes so, you have until 7 past or i guess okay. 37 past if you're in oh, great mm -hmm. thank you 
So my name is Andrei, I'm, I'm from Estonia, from Europe, and I'm going to show you how to write uh, really concise or expressive or readable or short automated tests in Appium uh, using uh, library Selenite. In just two minutes. So if you're writing some automated UI tests either for uh, web or for mobile applications, you should always have uh, several typical problems. Most of, uh, first of all, you have always problems with flaky tests and uh, with verbal syntax. You need to write too much of boilerplate code. <clears throat> These are typical problems. Uh, uh, they are always typical in Selenium tests, web tests, and they are probably even bigger in mobile tests because mobile is slower and so on. Uh, and I have one, one possible solution for this problem. This is a library called Selenite, which I created uh, 10 years ago, and which got uh, quite popular in web testing. Uh, so what is Selenite? Selenite is a free and open source library which gives you a concise syntax or API to write uh, readable and stable tests. Uh, more information can, you can find on site, selenite.org or in Twitter. And uh, first of all, I will, show, I will show a test for web, and then I will show how the same syntax can be used for mobile tests. <clears throat> uh, so how the test for web looks like using Selenite library? Selenite has actually quite a few methods, uh, two free methods. The first of all, you need to use method open, which just opens a browser. <clears throat> uh, at this point, Selenite wraps up uh, all that logic built inside of Selenium. It downloads the driver binary, it uh, initializes the driver with all those uh, complex settings, options, and so on. And for you, it's very simple. Just open your URL and it opens a browser. And then using method dollar, you can find some elements and dot and call some methods like set value, uh, click, uh, send keys, and so on and so on. There is plenty of methods. And finally, you can check some results. You can check that this element should get uh, some text or some class or some values and attributes and so on and so on. There is plenty of uh, features, but uh, I can, don't have time right now to talk about that in details. Uh, but shortly said, don't you think that this syntax is cool? I think it's cool. It's great because we uh, have short syntax. We have really readable tests, uh, which has built-in weightings, which solves most of flaky tests. Uh, yeah, probably I should say that all these methods like should have text, they actually do contain uh, waiting. You know, do wait a little bit if needed, if the element is being loaded still and so on. Uh, <clears throat> it has automated screenshots, uh, smart error messages and so on and so on, quite a lot of features. And the good news is that actually uh, Selenite can be also used for mobile, for testing mobile applications. Uh, there is special integration of Selenite with, with Appium on GitHub. And uh, now I'm going to show how Selenite looks like uh, for mobile tests. Uh, tests looks like actually really uh, very similar, really simple. Again, using method dollar, you can find some elements uh, by name, by XPath, by uh, whatever. And again, you can uh, do whatever you can do with typical Appium elements clicks and keys and so on. Uh, in this case, we see a test for a calculator in Android or in mobile. And in the end, we can assert the result, assert that some, some result field has a value of six. Uh, since we have a little bit of time, I can even run this test. I hope it will be fast. Yeah. Uh, as you see, this is a real code, real project. It absolutely executes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, any magic. <laughs> yeah, and as you see, this test is really uh, short and simple. Uh, so yeah, I hope you see my Android emulator, which which runs the tests and clicks uh, some buttons. Yeah, so with just a few lines in just a few minutes. <laughs> and you might ask, can you can I use some annotations, find by 
or something like that, or uh, mean my test to, to create page objects to make them even more readable. And the answer is yes, you can. Uh, you can use all that uh, app your annotations that we typically use, kind of Android find by, iOS find by, and so on. You can even mix uh, Selenium annotations and Appium annotations all together and even reuse the same page object for uh, both mo mobile platforms and for web tests, if occasionally you want to do it. <laughs> yeah, so a typical page object could look like this. And uh, then in test, you can, you can write even more readable and uh, yeah, concise tests. You can initialize page object using Selenite method screen and just use uh, methods or fields of this page object. And again, I search the result in the end. That was the demonstration of Selenite. And uh, yeah, overall, the good news that you can write concise and stable tests even in mobile applications. Yeah, uh, if you have any questions, I can answer. Or later, you can get me in Twitter or whatever. In, in Git, uh, and I can answer all the questions. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Andre. All right. Uh, I'm going to check just in case. Uh, it appears Kushan is not here. If you are here, Kushan, uh, we have time for your talk. Uh, otherwise, we'll assume he's not here. Uh, and we have time for one more person uh, can have five minutes in front of these 150 people. If they wish, uh, I guess just raise your hand in Zoom, all right, or something. Uh, I don't know if Pooja's around, if she wants to sing to us again this year, uh, I'm, I'm out for that as well. Um, we'll give it a minute to see if anyone volunteers. Yeah, I am just promoting Anil. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to... Uh... All right, Anil. Five minutes, and then Naresh, it's all right if we go over by two two minutes, right? Yep, that's fine. That's okay. fine. Good. It's all yours, Anil. Hey, hi everyone. Can you hear me? And yes. Is my video visible? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. Actually, I wasn't uh, prepared, but I thought of sharing one thought with all of you. So yeah, we talked about the technology, we talked about the Selenium, we are talking about the EPM and everything, right? So yeah, all this is good. I mean, we can achieve parallel execution, we can uh, reduce the test time and everything. So this, all things are fine, but when it comes to a testing, what I feel is uh, what we should be delivering is the product quality. And how we can deliver that product quality is when we think from an end perspective and end user perspective, so that is again a important thing which we should, which all all of you should consider. And uh, even that 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 is one case, and we should be thinking out of the box. So yes, looking at the technology, that is one perspective which is fine. But again, if we can think from uh, end user perspective, what they need, how they test it, definitely we are going to find more and more bugs. And with that, what we did is we actually, uh, we started one initiative, like we were executing all these test cases through our automation suite and everything. So we used to get a very little number of defects, but what we started as like, we called it as a break the app. So we as a team came up and uh, we decided let's break the app. Let's, let's think out of the box and let's try to find out as many defects as we can. So surprisingly, what we what we got is uh, through automation, we used to get hardly like a 10 defects or a 12 defects. But from this thinking out of the box, actually we could find more than 20 to 25 suggestions, not bugs, but the suggestions here. This is something which we can improvise in our app. So we actually uh, did a lot of uh, out of the box thinking there where we actually uh, tested our app against when, when the network is actually very poor, how, how do we our mobile app response? So that, that is something what we thought when the battery level is very low. And this is actually, uh, these are the real time problems which customer can face. So there are people who actually have a device 
uh, the storage limit is almost full. It's like a 90% of the device is full. And at that time, how our app performs. So these are the things actually we never uh, thought, but uh, we thought that there, these are the problems which customer can face and we could find more bugs around it. So what I wanted to tell again is when we think out of the box and when we think from end user perspective, that is something where we can achieve achieve good product quality and we all should aim for that product quality because we as a testers we wanted to deliver a good product quality and that is that should be our aim uh, yeah so that's the small interesting story i wanted to share all of you thanks for this Thank opportunity you. and oh, no worries uh, thanks to you and thanks to everyone else uh, who gave a talk today uh, it, it was looking pretty grim in the first five minutes but it, we pulled it together and i think uh, there was some good stuff here today uh, cool. Uh, since uh, I guess I'll draw the session to a close, and, and once again, thanks everybody. Thanks to Naresh and everyone with the organizing committee for organizing this. Uh, I guess the conference is over. We're just in day one, so I don't want to give the full like whatever. But um, I hope to see all of you uh, in person soon. Hopefully, the next time we do this conference or Selenium conference, uh, it will be reasonable for me to uh, make it out there uh, along with the rest of us, and we can do this in person again. Uh, well, hopefully uh, it's trending that way, you know, at some rate or another. Uh, anyways, uh, that's all I've got. Uh, and yeah, I, I was impressed with everything I saw today. Uh, I always enjoy going to India for a number of reasons that I won't go into right now. <laughs> you know, not, not just the, the amazing talks, but the you know, other things as well. Um, and I look forward to hopefully doing this again in a couple of years or maybe turning up at Selenium Conference next year or something like that. Uh, thanks so much, Naresh and everybody who organized this. And thanks to all the speakers.